excited about what God is doing here at Journey, and um, just, man, it's just a great place to be. I love, I love Journey. Um, let's pray. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit here right now. Uh, Jesus, God, you are so incredibly good. And Lord, just like we sang this morning, Lord, God, you are, you're all that we want. Gold and silver, you can take it, but Jesus, we want you. So Lord, just speak to us this morning, God. Speak to us this morning. May it just penetrate our being, penetrate our hearts. God, we want to know you deeper, Jesus. Not just a knowing about you, but to know you, Father. So Lord, we yield this time to you right now, Holy Spirit. Come today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 14 through 19, and we're going to be hanging out here all day, spending all of our time uh, in this one passage, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 and 19. Um, I think this passage is so important in light of where the church is today. We live in a crazy time, don't we? It's just insane, like the, the way the world is right now. But you know what? The world is always going to be the world. It's always been that way. It's always going to be that way. But what gets sad is when the church is no longer the church anymore. Yeah? That we're not any different. Like when Paul warns Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 4, he talks about how terrible it's going to be in the last days. It's not because the world is any different, because it's always been crazy, but it's because the church is so different. In the church, we find people who are lovers of self and lovers of money, and so many things we just take for granted in the church today. We're just surprised if our kids obey at all, right? So Paul is saying to Timothy, it's going to be terrible in the end, because even in the church, things will be bad, even in the church, there will be lovers of self. We say, love your neighbor as yourself. And some of us are like, well, I just got to learn to love myself first. I got to learn to love me. No, where do we get this from? What does it say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor? Where did it go to where you have to love yourself and then love God and then love your neighbor? Like, we've got it kind of mixed up, some of us, right? We love ourselves plenty. Everything is just for us. And Paul is saying it's going to creep into the church as well. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, instead of lovers for God. How many of you have ever seen The Deadliest Catch before? The Deadliest Catch, it's crazy, those guys. So they're, they're, um, they're out there and they're on the dead sea, uh, the, um, what's the, what's the sea? Out there in some ocean, right? And they're fishing for crab. And there's these waves coming at them. And there's, I was watching a clip the other day and there's these 40 foot waves, right? And the captain is in the hole. He's in the captain uh, part of the ship. And he's looking at his crew and he's having to count his crew because there's these 40 foot waves. I saw one where it's uh, 40 foot waves crashing both of them at the same time. And he's watching these guys left and right. And the captain is sitting there. He's so scared. He's like, guys, hold on right now. Here comes a big wave and they're holding on for dear life. And they get swayed left and right. And he's having to count his crew to see if they're still there, see if they're still with them. I mean, just insane. I don't think any crab is that good, is it? To be fishing for crab like that, I don't think it's that good. See, we can't control the waves out there, though. But you can control this boat. You can keep going in the right direction and keep the crew motivated. You can go, no, I'm not going to listen to what's out there. I'm not going to follow to what's out there. I know there are ways against this, and it seems we are going nowhere. But let's set our course, and let's keep it strong. We can't, we can't fix what is out there, but we can control our own ship. And I love what Paul says to Timothy, but as for you, but as for you, it's going to happen out there, Timothy, but as for you, but as for you and your house, this is what it's going to be like, right? 
And I find hope in the midst of all this craziness in the world. I find hope in what is going on out there through what we're about to read this morning in Ephesians 3. This is what it says. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. This is Paul praying for the church of Ephesus. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, when is the last time you prayed like that for someone else? I don't really hear people praying like that. I was challenged this past week to really do that for my team. So I wanted to, to pray like that for them individually, by name, to pray like that for them, that they would know the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of their love. I usually hear, God, will you just bless Susie? And God, will you, will you help her? And, and, and Lord, keep her from trouble. But man, what about their souls? Right? What about their soul? And Paul is saying, verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. He's bowing his knees because he realized he can't do it. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. This is just Paul reminding us that there is one being, one being from where everyone is made. The word there is this word, there is one father for all the other fathers. And that father they come from, it's, like, it's us taking a breath and realizing and having this revelation that our father in heaven just allowed us that breath. Come on, take a breath with me. See, God in heaven, he allowed you that breath. He allowed you to take that breath. You were able to do that only because God in heaven allowed you to do that. Get that this morning. You see, we have to get over ourselves. We are not all that important, despite what we might think. I'm telling you, there is one being who determines whether I take the next breath God determines that. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory. Think about that right now. The riches of his glory. The riches of his glory. The riches. I mean, he controls it all. He's in charge of it all. Anything we have, it's from him anyways. The riches of his glory. My dad, he's a, um, he's a pretty successful businessman, and uh, he has dinner with these guys, and they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Just insane. And I think about how, man, if they took their money and gave it to one city, how starvation could end just because of them giving it, Right? I think about Jeff Bezos, the creator of, of uh, Amazon. I'm so thankful for Amazon this time of year. I can just click the buy button instead of having to go to the mall and shop, and boom, it shows up there two days later. Amazing. But Jeff Bezos, he's worth $150 billion, $150 billion. I mean, what if he just decided, I want to end world hunger, and I want to give everything back to countries in Africa, right? Like he could actually do that. He could change cities and nations in Africa and, and end hunger. It's just crazy to think about. So, so the riches of his glory, we serve a God who's richer than Jeff Bezos, right? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So Paul in verse 16, according to the riches, the riches of his glory. And so it's that scene in Revelation, right? And he's glowing rubies and diamonds and it's coming from his throne. And there's lightning and there's thunder. And then there's a hundred million angels worshiping at his throne. 
This God, that same God, is in charge of all of us. Think about what he's capable of. Think about what he's capable of. So Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Your inner being, that's his prayer, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And that's what we need to pray for people, right, amen? That's what we need to pray for people. Not that Tim would stop smoking or Jimmy would stop looking at pornography or that my daughter would stop being so promiscuous or my son would stop smoking pot, but that we would pray, God, I want Caleb. Caleb's my son. God, I want Caleb to be strengthened with power through your spirit, and it would get into his inner being. God, I want Ruth, my daughter, to be strengthened with your spirit, and it would get into her inner being. God, I want, want, my, want my wife, Laura, to be filled with strength, with your power through your spirit, and it would get into her inner being. God, I want you, God, I want you, you, to be strengthened with power through your spirit, and it would get into your inner being. That's what I've been praying for you all week. That's what I've been praying for you. It would get into your inner being. It's that whole, uh, that, that promise in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 37, and God said, a day is going to come where I will pull, put my spirit inside of a human being. The people back then were like, no, God, there's no way. You can't put your spirit inside of a human being. You just can't do that. And God was like, watch, it's the whole valley of dry bones. I'm going to bring the dead to life. People are like, we see the Ark of the Covenant. We see the Holy of Holies. We see that power, and you're saying you're going to put that into a human being being, right? And he says, yes, exactly. I'm going to put it inside of you. And that day is going to come and I'm going to put my spirit in them and take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. And then from the inside, they're actually going to want to obey me. They're actually going to want to obey my commands. And so often in the church today, it's about rules and regulations, right? If I can just get my daughter to go to Bible study every week, or if I can get them to stop hanging around friends in the neighborhood, if I can, if I can, if I can do this, if I can do this, if I can, right? No, there is one factor. One factor, and it's the Holy Spirit. Either the Holy Spirit enters them and changes them from the inside out to where they become a slave for what's right and actually desire the things of God, then you don't really have to worry about them all that much. God becomes their master. Otherwise, you spend all day trying to set up programs and systems, and you get yourself into trouble because there is nothing going on in here. There's nothing going on in here. We have to get them to change their hearts from the inside out ourselves. We have to be changed from the inside out. So then people, they start blaming the church, man. They start blaming the church. They, they gave me these accountability partners, but they never called, and so I went back to drinking too heavy. No, that's not it, is it? It's because you were never changed from the inside out. You never fell in love with Jesus. And that's the only thing that does this. It's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about falling in love with Jesus. And then through falling in love with Jesus, you're going to want to do what is right. Amen? Yeah. And so that's why Paul, he prays for this reason. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, you I love that picture. You, as an individual, you being rooted in his love. It's that picture of these roots sinking deep into you, which is the love of Christ. It's like when the farmer started throwing out the seed, right? And some seed lands on rocky soil. What happened to the rocky soil? 
Yes, some things sprouted up, but there were no roots there. It never really penetrated. And so the moment the wind blows, they were all gone. Why? Because they were never rooted. They were never rooted. And so many people in our churches, they will keep coming to church and keep doing good things as long as the church protects them, as long as they live in this bubble, right? Don't let them out, get out in the world. Don't let them get too, 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 too much temptation. Keep them so busy that they can't sin. But then the moment they leave, and that's why our, the statistics are so bad for, for 18-year-olds. The moment they are no longer in that protected environment, then you realize that it never really took root. I don't want to stand up here today and act like I'm holier than thou but with what I'm about to say, but I don't know about you, but I could never leave Jesus. I could never leave him. I mean, honestly, like, kill me. I, 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 I couldn't leave Jesus. And you might say, Adam, well, it's not, you, 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 you work at a church and all this. It's not that I live in a protected bubble either. I couldn't, I couldn't leave him. And it's not that I'm even, that, even not tempted and I don't sin. I sin all the time. But I can never leave Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of my faith. He's my everything. Like, honestly, he really is. He's my everything. I could never leave him. Could you leave him? He's been so good to me. Once you've tasted and really seen and know of his goodness, man, you can't leave him. There's no way I could leave him. No way. Because I'm rooted and grounded in his love. I'm rooted and grounded in his love. Then Paul, he prays in verse 18 here. God, will these people have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of his love? Let them know your love, God, is his prayer. You see, he's on his face saying, God, just give them strength so that they can just uh, see how big this really is. They think it's about coming to a service. They think it's about not doing drugs. They think it's about walking down an aisle and praying a prayer. Oh, God, Paul is saying, oh, God, would you just give them strength by the glory of your riches? I know what you can do. God, will you do it? God, open their heart and give them strength. This is bigger. This is bigger than having a retirement fund. This is bigger than having nice kids. It's bigger than that. God, would you help them to see how wide and deep and the length and the breadth of your love. God, would you help them? That's the Paul's prayer here. God, help them. Help them to see it's so much bigger than this. In verse 19, that they may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That they may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. What an interesting phrase there. I want them to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I mean, how can you know something beyond knowledge, right? And that's the point. I could sit up here today and I could give you the Greek behind this and that, and I love that. There is, we, we love teaching, and there's good application for that. There is absolutely, that is good. There's nothing wrong with that. That is good. But the point of this morning, the point of this morning is that you would love God and you would realize that, man, I want to go beyond just knowing about him and really knowing him. And I want my family to go beyond just knowing about him and to really know him. I want my coworkers to go beyond just knowing about him and really just know him. I want the people that I'm around to go beyond just knowing about him and really know him. To have a relationship with him. That's what I want. That's what I want more than anything. It's the response we have that says, I will gladly take up my cross and follow you. I will sell everything I have. I will sell it all just to follow you, God, because you are my treasure. It goes beyond anything else in this earth. You're all that matters, God. So Paul is saying, I can't make this happen except when I'm down on my knees. 
And it's not putting them in a Christian school. Again, that is good. It's not letting them out on Friday nights, and that can be good depending on the situation, right? That doesn't matter, but what matters is the Holy Spirit. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge in the last phrase there, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When people describe you, do they describe you as, when that guy is full, that girl is full with the fullness of God. I don't know about you. I don't know what your goal is in life. I don't know what your aspirations are. I don't know what you're going through, but I decided long ago that I wanted to be known as somebody who is real, doesn't put on a front, and just loves God, and just pursues God with all their heart. That's what I want to be known for. You see, but I get so distracted sometimes. I get distracted with, man, I want to make money. I, I have these, these side hustles, and uh, I want to provide for my family. I want to be free, and I get distracted from all these things. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that until we get distracted, right? I get distracted with all these things. Maybe you were like me. Maybe you're like me this morning. You get distracted with what really matters, which is loving God and pointing people to him, pointing people to Jesus, to get down on your knees like Paul is, is there every morning to say, God, may they know you, Jesus. May my coworkers, God, may they know you, God. May they know the length and the height and the depth and the breadth of your love, Jesus. They have to know you, God. I am begging you, God, I can't do it on my own. I can give these words. I can say these things. But God, I can't do it on my own. May your Holy Spirit come and move in their hearts, God. And may they be filled and may they get it from within their inner being. Because God, I know that's the only thing that sticks. God, that's, I know that's the only thing that works. God, the people we are around, may you do that for them, Jesus. We are begging you, Father, because, God, we can't do it on our own. And, Lord, we have to know you. Lord, we love you. That's what Paul is doing there. He's begging. He's crying out to God for that. He's crying out to God. Something you need to know, too, is in the church, the church of Ephesus there, right? The church of Ephesus Paul was their pastor for three years. Timothy was their pastor following. They knew they had the best, best teaching in the, in the ancient world, in the early church. They had the best teaching. They knew about God. They knew him. Much like we do today, we live in the Bible Belt, right? We live in the South. We live in the Bible Belt. We've been, some of us have been going to church all our entire lives. We've heard the gospel over and over, over, over and over again. We know about God. Also in Ephesus, there was a, one, of the, uh, one of the ancient seven ancient wonders of the world. There was a God on the outside, Artemis, and people from all around would come to worship this God, and so they were surrounded by pagan worship. Don't we, aren't we kind of similar? Aren't we the same way? Where we worship things, we put other gods before the one true God. We, we put other gods before Jesus, just like they did. Whether it's money or our career or whatever it might be, we put things before God. In Revelation chapter 2, it says this about them, though. To the angel of the church in Ephesus writes, the words of him who holds the, star, the seven stars in the right hand, who walks among the seven lampstands. Verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. You see, it says you've suffered for me. 
You've even endured patiently. You have not grown weary. And many of us, we feel the same way about ourselves. Man, God, I've suffered for you. God, I haven't grown weary. I've, I've, I've done things for you, God. But have you lost your first love? Man, have you lost your first love? Are you so deeply in love with Jesus? Have you lost your first love? Because, man, I was reading this this week, going to the next verse here. If I can be honest, man, I, I was kind of grieving a little bit. Verse 5, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. Repent meaning change the way you think. Change your mindset and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. If we don't turn our hearts towards God, God says to the church in Ephesians, like us, that is very similar to us, he will remove their lampstand. Basically, we can put two and two together. I know Revelation is, is really hard to understand sometimes, but we can put it together. What does that mean? Hell. I worry for the souls in this room today. If you've lost your first love, you may have even gone through stuff and suffered for Jesus, but you might have lost your first love. Man, I just feel, if I can be open and honest with you, I, I have this feeling in my heart sometimes, and it just kind of creeps up for different things, that where I feel like the church, the church in general, not Journey, Journey, I love Journey, not journey, but the church in general, sometimes we, we're missing it somewhere along the way. Something is off. Something is wrong. We're doing all these things for God, but we've lost our first love. I think, that, I think that's us. That's the Bible belt of, of the United States. We've lost that first love. We've gone through the motions and we're serving, we're serving, we're doing, we're doing. But man, we've lost our first love. Will God rekindle that love within our hearts again when we first gave our heart to Jesus, amen? That's what I want for you. That's what I pray for you. That's what I desire for you more than anything else. I've been praying that all week for you. That you would rekindle your first love again. And man, if, when you were madly in love with Jesus and, and it stirred up in your heart and you're on fire for the Lord, that you would pray this prayer that Paul prayed for the people you were around. Because we can't do it. We can't do it. Arguing and, not arguing, but debating can only get so far. Debating another person can only get so far. They have to get it within their inner being. Can we stand to our feet right now? Jesus. God, help us not to be guilty. Like the church of Ephesus, Lord, we've lost our first love, God. Lord, may we be so madly in love with you, Jesus. God, get that into our inner being, Father. Stir up our hearts, God. Stir up our hearts of passion for you, Jesus. All over this room, can we just shut our eyes right now? Let's just begin to pray. If you're a believer and you love the Lord, come on all over this room, let's just pray for everyone in this room, for, the, for God to stir up in our hearts a passion for him, to stir up our hearts, our love for him again. Come on, let me hear you. Come on, let me just pray out loud right now. God, we ask you, Lord, Lord Jesus, we can't do it on our own, God, but stir up within our hearts a passion for you, Jesus. God, may we be rooted and may we be grounded in your love. May that get into our inner being that we would know the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of your love, Jesus. God, that's what we want. That's what we desire, God. That's what we desire, Lord. Jesus.
spread over your life. Give me a heart. Come on, pray that over your family right now. time. Sing it again. And God, give me a heart of that. Let that be your prayer. Come on, fill this room with your worship. It's our prayer, oh God. It's our prayer, oh God. we have to get it. Lord, let us get it, Jesus. Let us get it. It's so much bigger than just doing church and playing games, Lord God. Let every soul, every heart, every person get it, God. Jesus, we need you, God. We are nothing without you, Lord. We're nothing without your presence, without your spirit, Father. You're all that we want, Jesus. With every head bowed, Every eye closed right now. If you would say this morning, I don't know Jesus. I don't know this Jesus you've been talking about. I don't have a love for Jesus. Would you raise your hand right now? We want to pray with you. If that is you this morning, please raise your hand. I've been praying for you this week. Is that anyone? That anyone? Yes, God, 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 God. How many of you love the Lord? Come on, how many of you love the Lord? How many of you love God with all your heart, all your soul? Come on, worship Him. Worship Him. We worship you, God. Me, a heart. A... Come on, worship Him if you love Him. Give Him your worship. That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. God, we love you, Jesus. God, we love you, Jesus. How long is you? Come one more time with all you have right now. God, give me a heart of that. God, I pray that every person this week, God, may they taste and see and know of your goodness, God, as we leave this place, God. God, set our hearts ablaze for you, Jesus. Lord, we really want to know you, God. My challenge for you this week, if I can challenge you, my challenge for you this week is, man, pray this prayer in Ephesians, Ephesians, 14, th- uh, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 19. Pray this prayer for your spouse. Pray this prayer for your family. Pray this prayer for your coworkers. Pray this prayer for everyone you know, man. Their souls are at stake. This is a battle, guys. This is for real. This is not fake. This is for real. This is for real. There's a battle. There's a war being waged. Let's pray for their souls this week, yeah? Will you do that with me? This is not a game. It's not a game. It's not a game. Paul got it. Paul got it. He knew he could tell him until he was blue in the face, but he got it. He knew he needed to get down on his his knees and beg the Lord, Lord, fill him up. God, fill him up. May they get it. May they know it. I pray you know it this week. Pray for someone else to know it. Amen.
Amen. If you're here this morning and uh, need a Thanksgiving basket, we would be honored and so blessed to be able to do that for you. If you go through these doors right here at the end of the hallway, they'll direct you and we'll get you a basket. And uh, just pray that you enjoy that with your families. Also, we need about 25 people to help distributing more baskets that we have that are left over. If you visit the Next Step Center and sign up, if you are able to deliver more baskets, that would be amazing. Go, have a great week. Love you guys. See you all next week.